Hi guys, thank you so much. This is our final, final event for the uh, WMC Fest. Uh, at least in terms of the talking portion, uh, there's gonna be some comedy happening tonight as well as some more music. Um, so if you're around, you will be entertained. Um, so this is a little bit of a different uh, format than the other panel discussions that we've been through today. This is actually gonna be a debate. Um, and the idea from this came from uh, our friend Keenan Cummings, who, as you know, had a call in sick. Um, so uh, he runs this uh, debate program in Brooklyn where designers get together, creative people get together to kind of talk about, you know, the relative merits of any kind of subject in, you know, a casual but also still meaningful way. Um, so today we're going to talk about what it means to do what you love and like how that's a little bit confusing and complicated and, and not necessarily something that people can just like do automatically. Um, and I would like to introduce our uh, substitute amazing moderator. Her name is Erin Aniker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, she calls herself a people enthusiast. Uh, her company is called Betwixt, where she and her teammate Esther help women in design connect with their people. Together they facilitate Spark, which is a very dynamic online community, and are working on launching a course this fall on creating meaningful connections for indie designers. Everyone give it up for Erin. Thank you, Margo. So thanks everyone for coming. We've got a really great panel here. And um, I'll just run through real quick the structure that we're going to uh, impose upon the panelists and um, where you guys' parts will be in this participation. Um, so first up, we'll start with introductions from each of the panelists, and then we'll move into, um, there will be four different rounds of debate. I can't quite do four fingers there, but um, the first one uh, is opening arguments. Second one, duels and rebuttals. Third is audience Q&A. Fourth, closing arguments. And then last will be voting. <laughs> Are you getting nervous? You don't have to be nervous. <laughs> Chris yeah. Gell volunteered earlier today to take off his shirt and just appear to be, you know, <laughs> if anybody needed any, like, relief. That's your man. Anyway, so... First up, intros from the panelists. We'll start on this end. Hi, I'm Mel. Um, I'm a digital strategist at NPR. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm James. I'm a designer by trade and an interdisciplinary artist. My name is Megan Cook, and uh, I am most passionate about teaching graphic design to prison inmates, which inspired me to pursue a project called Designing Sunshine, which is about shining light into the shadows of this world. And a part of that is applying design thinking to real life. Hi, I'm Charlene King. Uh, I'm a senior designer at Morningstar, the financial research firm, not the veggie patties. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm also the programming director for AIGA Chicago and an aspiring cat behaviorist. <laughs> I don't know how to follow that. Um, I, I think you're pretty cool with fine, you know, starting design sponge. I like, I like, <laughs> I like <laughs> I think you won, you won. I'm Grace, I run a blog called Design Sponge and I have a podcast called After the Jump about uh, women in business, particularly in the design community. Um, I am also, I would say, a professional cat enthusiast, so take that, Charlene. Um, no, I'm um, no, an aspiring cat enthusiast as well. Um, Jessica Jacobs, I am an artist and a designer and I'm a professor at Columbia College Chicago where I teach the business of art and design. I was a cat enthusiast, but now have suddenly developed a cat allergy, which is very, very upsetting. So, yeah. Are we The struggle is real. It's, I know. <laughs> Thank you, guys. All right, so round one. What does do what you love mean to you, and why are you either for or against it? Let's start back here. 
on the end. So are we starting with the opening remarks? Is this the opening remarks? Yes, this yeah. is opening okay. remarks. Because we, we, we have a sign rule. We'll divide each other up into doing those yeah. parts, if that's a, okay. Yeah, okay. we have Go a plan. It. It's too late if not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I want to start off by really quickly saying that, I don't know if, if for those of you who are in the gender and sexuality panel at 3 o'clock, I just kind of want to acknowledge like the privilege that exists in the debate we're about to have, because I feel like after listening to that panel, this seems like such an incredibly wonderful conversation to have, but one that doesn't seem quite as crucial. So I just want to put that out there. Um, but for our pro side, I want to start by saying that we think do what you love is a phrase designed to buoy and motivate anybody struggling to find time to do um, more of what they love in their life. The word more is operative for us because we think that the phrase do what you love does not imply that you're doing that thing you love full time that you're doing it exclusively, or that you're doing it to the detriment of yourself or anybody else around you. In addition, we think do what you love does not mean to do those things without planning. We don't see impulsiveness in that phrase, and we don't recommend it. We're not going to be telling anybody to just quit their jobs and do what they love. We also think that do what you love is a choice to prioritize happiness whenever possible, and to make that as much of a goal as possible and to make doing what you love as big a part of your day as you can. We don't think or don't want anybody to prioritize any type of job over another one because what you love is completely subjective and open to interpretation. Today we're here to emphasize the ways in which we believe do what you love is a motivating phrase that can be used to push through difficult times and a way to inspire people to do more of what they love for as much of their day as possible. <laughs> Somebody had a meeting before this. <laughs> so, would you guys like to present your opening arguments? Or if you would, please. One by one, briefly. Sure. Is that good? Yeah. Um, one of uh, my arguments against, uh, naturally, I'm on the con side because I work with prisoners, so um, I was happy to be here. <laughs> Oh, of course I'm on that side. I found my home. Um, but I do feel like it's a, a statement that uh, promotes rose-colored glasses in a way. Um, and especially working with the population I do, it is not, uh, it's a very middle-class mindset, and it's not one that's easily accessible to all populations, specifically ones uh, who come from generational poverty. And I would also say... Um, at what cost uh, do you pursue what you love and question whether it's really a leaping off point uh, mentality that we want to promote to our youth specifically. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> like, how do you go after that? Um, my main reasons for being on the opposing side is um, it's mainly on the degrees of privilege and how much that that phrase, do what you love, holds in that. Um, a lot of times there's the thought behind economics. You know, a lot of times people will not be able to do what they love because they have to put rent, on the, um, rent for their home, food on the table. Um, also, it, it um, completely does not address things like people who are unable to get internships, with make it, which makes it much easier for people to quote unquote do what you love. And it's just, as you said, like rose-colored glasses and not really looking at all the privileges that come with using that as very blanket career advice. I think the phrase, do what you love, is kind of the next living the American dream phrase. Mm -hmm. um, and thinking about where that comes from and how people view that in terms of attaining it is not always something, I think it's a very Americanized very coming from the point of privilege, very much do you have the means to be able to do what you love and not thinking about, I, I'm not sure that that's the mentality that exists everywhere in the world. Um, and so it, it's a loaded phrase and I think it comes from a place of privilege. So moving quickly into round two, uh, <laughs> let's see what I read. Duels and rebuttals. Would you guys like to respond on the pro side to the idea of privilege and um, what it takes in order to actually follow that dream and do what you love and what assumptions are underlying that, how you would respond to those things? Well, I think one of our first main points is to acknowledge, yes, there, it is 
it is coming from a p place of privilege, but rather than saying like, don't, don't pursue that, don't follow that, we should all work together to support each other, to enable each other to, to do more things that we're passionate about and to work within the system to change the system, to create more funding for artists, to, to call people out when they have unpaid internships, when they're a huge you know, fashion house or something like that, to sort of change the system on the one hand and then at the other hand, encourage people to find out what it is they like to do and to try to pursue that. Um, is, is one rebuttal to, to one of those points. I don't know if you guys had any other? Oh, of course I do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I would like to share a little, a little personal anecdotal story because I think a lot of times when we bring up this idea of do what you love as privilege, um, we're really responding to uh, that platitude we hear at like $1,200 conferences from people who were paid 10 grand to say, like just shore out the same recycled bullshit. And that, that doesn't mean the advice itself is bad, it means how it's been um, hung up to dry is really awful. But you know, like I left home when I was 16 because my conservative Christian parents were not cool with the whole gay thing. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I was homeless for a time, and I dropped out of high school, and, you know, I worked as a security card, as a bike messenger, and eventually I came across, like, mentors who, like, pushed me to go to college, and, you know, somehow I ended up in Chicago with a full scholarship at the School of the Art Institute, and, you know, the thing is, like, I could have been swallowed up into a life that was you know, like working class and much with much more struggle than I live now. And that didn't mean I had to exclude enjoyment from my life. There was still always, you know, I was still able to surround, like be around art as a security guard. I was able to bike as a bike messenger. And while I wouldn't color those occupations as easy, especially compared with my occupation now, that doesn't mean there was no joy or love in my life. <laughs> just just the digression me and james are actually friends so that's why like i also love winning against my friends so <laughs> yeah, yeah so so uh would you guys care to respond to the idea of of pursuing happiness in the little ways and um seeking out mentorship and or um, internships, paid internships, in order to pursue what you love? I th what I think what limitations are there? I think that we assume that everyone has the luxury of time um, to pursue these things. And, you know, if, if you're taking public transportation and you're transferring lines and, and you know, you, you have to work several jobs and, and you don't necessarily have the luxury or indulgence of time to be able to pursue what you love, you're trying to put food on the table. Um, I can think of several people where if I said to them, you know, you should just do what you love, they would look at me like I had three heads um, because they're trying to make ends meet on a daily basis. So I think it's a nice ideal, um, but I don't think it's necessarily something everybody can pursue. And I, I think a lot about why we love TED Talks um, or why, you know, why TED Talks are so successful. And in a way, it's this kind of masturbatory, self-indulgent, like, th this is the ideal, every, talking about different topics. and. Just not everybody has the luxury to do that. And I think to kind of um, bounce on that is the phrase, do what you love. What you love doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a career. Like I think about my dad and he's been working in factories and as a janitor for years. But what he loves is providing for his family. He loves playing um, sports and baseball with us and things like that. So asking him do what you love, would that mean that my dad would have to have a career in coaching or things like that? Well, a couple points, but first, so often I hear do what you love prefaced with just, and that pisses me off because we've all sat through this conference and listened to people talk about how hard they worked and, and how they struggled and how there was these horrible, awful moments where they questioned if they were doing the right thing or they were really scared. And um, I think that it's important that we acknowledge that fact and support each other more. And I don't think that starting those conversations happens by saying, just do what you love. And 
my own personal story, like never in a million years did I think that I would love teaching in a prison. Like, who says that? Like, today I'm going to wake up and I'm going to go teach these somewhat scary men. Some of them kind of are really scary. Um, you know, like on for face value, you're know, like, what did I just do? I think I might be crazy. Um, and I hated it at first. I totally hated it and I almost quit because it was really hard and uh, I hadn't taught before and I was unsure. And what got me through those moments was like, fuck this, I'm not a quitter. Um, I know what education did for me and while I might see a lot of anger, I also see these people with a lot of passion, and I want to see where design can help me take that passion. And so kind of through default and through my own stubbornness, I stumbled into something I love, but it certainly was never in a million years a leaping off point. I, th I think also, like, you know the hierarchy of needs that you learn about in like Psych 101? Like, do you feel safe? Do you have shelter? Do you have enough food? Like, there has to be a baseline level before you can say, okay, now I can think about doing something that I love and not something that I need to do. Would you guys like to speak to that? I had just yes. written down the hierarchy of needs just earlier today. <laughs> so it was just funny. Um, I think that the other thing to remember with the do what you love is not necessarily like we're calling out to everyone, you must do what you love or else your life has no meaning. Um, I think it's a phrase meant to inspire people that, like I think a lot of the people in this room who do have a passion, that it's meant to sort of encourage you to try to develop that, to work on it, to hone it, um, to maybe figure out is that indeed what you want to do or not want to do, but it's meant to be an encouragement and, and to find like-minded people and to really explore that. I, I don't think we should interpret it as holding other people back. Um, and I, I don't think that's how most people mean it. Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge there are two very different debates happening right now. Mm -hmm. um, there's one against the phrase, just do what you love, which I think every single person up here agrees is bullshit, and no one should ever tell someone to just do what you love. That's complete crap and doesn't acknowledge any of the inequity that exists in a number of different levels. None of us on this side believe in just do what you love. We think it's ridiculous. Um, and I think there are some slight differences in experience on this panel, and that like I could never speak to what you're doing, and I think that if I was coming from your perspective, I would completely agree with the idea of it's, it's unfair to tell people who are imprisoned to just focus on the things that make them happy when they're very different day-to-day -day needs. But at the same time, the luxury of time, the luxury of doing things you love, it's a scale, and I think that this phrase doesn't imply there's only one end of it. For us to just think that doing what you love is only fancy graphic design and high-paying web positions, like, no one's saying that. Do what you love is completely different. One of the hardest working people I know um, in design is a friend of mine who is an immigrant from Peru and has two children and works more than I've ever seen a single person work. Um, she has so little time in her day to do anything fun and design related, but she finds that time despite like not having very much money, not having a professional education, and still having two terrible small children. <laughs> 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 privileged kid who doesn't want to do something I don't want to do. That's a big difference. Yeah, and we're talking about embracing the things you're passionate about and finding a way to make it some part of your day, not all of it. I think James made a great argument for our side by talking about how his dad found time to play sports and hang out with the family. I mean, you know, like, who said that, like, the only thing we, lo we love is design? I mean, I think you know, this is something that's very true, is the most interesting people design the best work. If you're a boring person who only hang, like, hangs out by themselves and ignores everyone else in the world, your work is gonna suck. And you know, if you, if you, if you love your family, you know, you're gonna be home for them. If you love your friends, you will find time to hang out with them. If you love, I don't know, like McDonald's and you wanna work at Leo Burnett for 80 hours a week and make POS, systems for them, cool, you know, but <laughs> whatever you, you know, you can find time for the things you love, you know, the world is not a better place for your sacrifice of your own happiness, you know, like, um, 
like when the typhoon hit the Philippines, me and a bunch of friends just like spent 30 minutes on a Saturday putting together a Tumblr where we posted photos of drawings we drew and we asked people on the internet like through Twitter to just like take snapshots of money they've donated to help people in the Philippines and we would mail them drawings we did. That, you know, that was just something we've, we felt the three of us we wanted to do, you know? We took time from our day. And yes, that's a luxury that not everyone has, but you know, if you're, you know, like when I was working 80 hour weeks to put myself through college, I still like, you know, found time to do little things I liked, you know? And that doesn't mean you have to give up everything else in the world, I mean like ignore what you have to do for rent, ignore what you have to do to put food on the table. That's not doing what you love, that's being delusional. <laughs> so one of the things I've been thinking about is how there are a lot of people just coming out of college, um, and just so you know, I'm, I'm switching gears just slightly, but there are a lot of people just coming out of college who have no idea what it is that they love and what it is that they're passionate about. And that this blanket uh, command is asking a lot of them. It's asking a lot of um, self-knowledge and self-knowing. And, um, and I'm curious like what each side would think about or thinks about what we are asking of the next generation and what kind of pressure we're putting on them with that question. And if, if it's a positive thing, how can we change that question to make it a little bit more um, action oriented and small baby steps instead of like, you need to decide what you're going to do for the rest of your life right now. I think it's finding out how you like to work and not necessarily what you like to work on. Um, whether you like to work by yourself or whether you like to work in a team, whether you like to work, you know, you, you could be working for like some horrible, evil organization doing design, but if you work with like a good team of coworkers and you know, you might not feel fulfilled by the work that you're doing, but at least you have, it, it, it's, it's like finding out how you like to work and not what you like to work on, I would say, is, is a, a, something that takes time and you wouldn't necessarily know out of school. I mean, I would say sort of similar, and now we're gonna say the same thing, um, but like finding what you like to do like, let, do what you love to do. Like, I went to school for film, I, I love film, but actually I hate making films. So I found that out and I don't do that. Um, and then, you know, in, in, in some ways when you find yourself working in a windowless office for, you know, a evil corporation, that, yeah, exactly, finding something that you like about what you're doing or serving some higher purpose. And a, a coworker talks about he finds passion in his work through serving, and so it's with the college graduates, start with what you're interested in, figure out what you like to do, what are you good at doing, and then build up from there. We don't have to go from, I graduated to now I'm, I love what I do and I'm the most fulfilled, self-actualized person ever, so. There seems to be this weird sense of like defensiveness built in to everyone like who reacts to this and has a really very specific idea of what that phrase means, especially in the terms of like, do, find out exactly what you want and then do that. But to me, do what you love doesn't mean just do one thing. What you love is going to change over the course of time. Maybe your love when you're 23 is completely different. God, I hope it is, otherwise. <laughs> um, it's gonna change and it's gonna evolve. And it's like we were talking before the panel about that and that some people like design or all you're talking about, but at the end of the day, your passion and your love might eventually evolve to be your family. And so you start prioritizing spending more time with your family versus spending time being some sort of ultimate best designer in the entire world. So doing what you love doesn't become an inaccurate phrase. It just changes. You and that's to develop a cat allergy. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Let's not talk about it. I'm very upset. I know. Very upset. I, I agree that um, I think it's important to remember that love is an evolutionary process. And I think I'm glad you brought up this population because uh, I feel like those are the people perhaps uh, the most potentially confused by the phrase of what you love. I, I wish we promoted something a little more different, a, a mentality especially to younger people or people exploring to do just that, to explore, to have a drive towards things that you're interested in that maybe are kind of scary and you're blindly fumbling about and it's okay because it, a lot of design school uh, doesn't promotes the end product, um, the final 
uh, poster or whatever, the design, and not the process. And where do you really learn? It's the process in which you learn. And so I wish it was more those types of things that we were promoting so people could have a more um, successful journey or feel more successful in their journey towards the path of finding what it is they do love to do. Like if the phrase were, feel free to explore. <laughs> yeah. yeah, something like that. And then like there's going to be really shitty parts because mm -hmm. there's a lot about doing what you love that you don't actually really love at all. Yeah, I mean, and you know, it's a like... Lot of the problems with that phrase is it, com it completely ignores all the shitty parts yeah. too. It's like you do what you love until it gets shitty, which it is. And then you're like, all right, so should I stop? Should I move? But, yeah. but here's the thing. If you have a phrase that spends even half of its phrase acknowledging all the shitty parts of stuff, that's not going to be the motivation that gets you through the hard stuff. For me, for someone to say, like, do what you love, you're going to hate yourself for five years, that is going to be awesome. Like, when you're in those five years, I don't, I want to hear the things that make me feel happy and hopeful. I don't want to hear someone telling me, like, it's going to blow, just work through it. Like, yeah. I want to hear something that makes me happy. And so I think that's that optimism that it gets, and it's a completely naive optimism at times, but it's an optimism that gets a lot of people through it, and if it doesn't get you through it, I don't see it implying the same sense of like, you have to make this phrase work for you that I think some people feel it implies. Can we get a t-shirt of that? If it's gonna blow, just work through it. <laughs> yes. I mean, All you right, know, so like, I feel like we were a generation raised up on this idea that if you work hard, go to college, you can like, accomplish anything in the world and like clearly that wasn't true and a lot of us are being burnt with this idea like with college loans and all of this financial burden that like being taught that with at the exclusion of all the other real life lessons um, was very bad and you know like the do what you love thing really requires that caveat of like figure out what you love first, you know, and take it slow. You have your life to live, you know. No one says you have to, like, figure it out all in, like, that, like, year before you go to college and then, like, the preceding months after you graduate college. My ear is really small. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so with that, sorry. I'd like to move on to round three, where we open it up to you guys and hear what you have to ask. What are your burning questions? Oh, oh no, no, bad. no, Your uh, no. hand was up first, <laughs> and then in the red. This is a tough question, I think. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna throw, there's something I feel like was maybe missing from this conversation, which I was reminded of by the panel that we just had. What if what I love is something that directly or indirectly causes somebody else harm? What if what I love to do is to surround myself by like, with like-minded people who think what I think and affirm what I think, and I don't wanna be around people who are challenging, who remind me of my white privilege, who remind me of my cisgender privilege? I think that's fine. I mean, Mitt Romney has a design team, doesn't he? <laughs> wow. I mean, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a. This is they wanted it's unpopular opinion time, but I, I really don't. I, like, as a queer feminist, I, I don't think this country can function without Republicans. I really don't. And it's not because, like, I think they're geniuses. It's because I think there always has to be some kind of uh, opposition to whatever you believe in because you need to be kept in check. You know, Chicago runs under the Democratic machine and there's very little Republican opposition and that means corruption is often really difficult to suss out and clean up. You know, I mean, you don't have to be part of Illinois to hear about Rod Blagojevich. <laughs> uh, all of our governors being arrested. I mean, you know, it's, it's bad when there's no opposing opinion. And if someone wants to be someone who is in a homogenous culture surrounded by people who won't challenge them, but it makes them happy at the end of the day and they're contributing in a different way, I mean, you know, as, as much as it pains me to say, I mean, you know, Mitt Romney might be a good father. 
He, <laughs> I mean, you know, like, just because someone doesn't agree with you, just because he wants me to not be able to get married, doesn't mean he's a 100% bad person. I think it would be a very, you know, sim simplicated, simplistic way of viewing the world and people who are different from you. Also, in, in every, different, we learned why we shouldn't use that word, but um, in, in, in every group that's marginalized, it doesn't assume, it doesn't mean everybody agrees. I mean, just on that panel, I mean, we were looking at Phyllis, who felt incredibly comfortable with labeling herself as a black, lesbian, feminist mother and kept returning to those labels because they were a place of pride for her. And then Rusty and Dane were people who felt uncomfortable or not ready to claim labels or didn't even believe in the idea of labels. So that's one community that for some people might seem like one homogenous mass of people who identified as queer. But within that queer community, people will completely disagree and will yell and fight about things that on the outside people would never assume those happened on the inside. But Can we get a, a response from the con side? <laughs> Come on, James. He had some good things to say. Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, in terms of pe hurting people, I mean, that kind of scares me. Um, <laughs> thank you. It's nice to have support. Um, <laughs> no, but uh, it, it kind of shifting a little bit, I was talking to someone before I came about building a successful design business and how um, she looked back and she was really focused on what she was doing and she looks back on raising her children and says they, they really didn't get the best from me and I see that now, I didn't see it then and I think that there is something to be said for while you're pursuing you know, what you love inside your heart to remember the people you love around you and that you're not so hyper-focused that really can propel you forward that you're leaving some people you really care about in the lurch, you know? Thank you. Right here in the red. Hi, uh, thanks for sharing today. Uh, my question um, is, if you could, each side could speak to maybe the narcissism that either is implicit or is being overcome by the phrase, do it to love. Um, I just wanna know maybe at what point sense of self is not worth or is definitely worth um, promoting in the phrase, do it to love, if that makes sense. So is that kind of a, what I want to do versus what the world needs? Yeah, sorry, what, maybe what does a community need or what are the um, societal needs versus what are my own needs, mm -hmm. if that's part of the debate? I think one of the things our team talked a lot about in preparation for this was the idea of balance and how the ideal version of that phrase would be to strike a balance between what was the inherently narcissistic part of this discussion of finding exactly what you want, what makes you happy, with what would be helpful and good for the rest of the world. And I think. Charlene's example of being able to take a skill you have that makes you happy and do something to help other people with that skill would be the ideal version, at least for me, of what do what you love can represent. Amen. Um, <laughs> no, I, I totally am on board with that. I, I think that's another thing we could really um, find more of a sense of purpose by in getting a little outside of ourselves and focusing on others and remembering them and thinking about how we can help each other, how we can support each other, how we can build community. Um, that makes everybody better. And there's so many rewards. It's like a win-win across the masses kind of situation when you can um, pursue those kinds of things. I just wonder how this phrase would play in a country or place where people don't have the ability to speak freely or, or kind of, you they know, or women Twitter. don't have the ability to speak freely or um, how, the, how this might play out in other places in the world. Because I think this is a very American idea um, yes. and I'm not sure it's a very world idea. <laughs> yeah. I, I completely disagree with that. Um, Me too. I, th I think to do is, oh, sorry, go ahead, you do it. Oh, okay, sorry. thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, like, like, you know, I'm, I, I'm half joking, I, I mean, yeah. I'm half joking about being on Twitter, but like Arab Spring tour, I mean, there's so many, uh, you know, the, the barrier of entry to technology has never been more accessible. 
Um, and people from all over the world are dependent on these technologies now because it can circumvent governments that would otherwise prevent you from being able to do whatever makes you happy. Except maybe North Korea? Yeah, that's the country <laughs> I was thinking of. But you know, like, you know, there are books, if, if anyone wants to read about it, I love studying North Korea. Uh, I have book recommendations on that, but... In North Korea, there are pe people flee, uh, flee North Korea. I mean, you know, people, like, people, they're, they're not, they're prison camps in North Korea not because their people are complacent about it. They're prison camps because people challenge it and try, and people try to cross the border. I mean, you know, Veronica's family wouldn't be here if they weren't trying to get away from, you know, the, from Cuba and the limitations of Castro's government, you know? Like, yes, it's like, the idea of me being able to make a Tumblr is an example of privilege, but I think it would be hard to argue that an activist in China trying to fight for free internet isn't trying to do what they love. And they are paying a, hev a much heavier price than I do when I sit on Tumblr. But they're still fighting for it. Well, it's, an, it's a false assumption to assume that because somebody is not from America, they don't have the exact same desire to be happy. That desire to be happy is probably much further down the pole than it is a desire to survive, if that's a much bigger concern in their day-to-day -day life. But to think that somebody, it's the same issue with that phrase, first world problem, which just assumes that people living in America are the only people who think about these things. Like, people think about being happy in every country in the world, but they probably have much more pressing concerns to think about. So I think, yes, this phrase is not something that everybody across the globe can think about in the same way we can think about right now. But to assume that people in a different country don't care about being happy is just completely inaccurate. Would you like to respond to that at all? Do you have any thoughts? I, well, I, I don't think that's what I was, I wasn't saying that it wasn't the ability to be happy. I, I, I was responding more to the phrase, are you able to do what you love? Which I think are two different things. I think fighting for happiness is very co-related to doing what you love. You know, because if you don't have what you love, there's still the pursuit of that, and that's about obtaining the same goal. If you have the luxury to be in that mentality, and it is a luxury to be in that mentality, it really is. I feel like there's so many people in this world just struggling to make ends meet, to have food in the refrigerator. They're so dead tired at the end of the day or have legitimate fears of being raped uh, while they sleep uh, or you know, horrible, awful things that completely negate something like, tomorrow I just want to be happy and do what I love. It's a beautiful premise, but it's not accessible to, to people when they're dealing with those kinds of things. It's just, it's just not a mentality that it feels so distant and remote and un, unattainable. And I feel like that's the biggest problem with the phrase because it is so blanket and even for something where it's so prevalent at a design conference like this. Every single one of us are dealing with our own shit, so we don't know about that, you know? Mm -hmm. How are we doing on time? Okay. So um, I'll take uh, one more question. And I think over here was the first hand I saw. <coughs> Two questions. Here's the first. How do you uh, address the fact now, though? I was going to be. I knew I was going to do that. <laughs> How do you address the fact when you started on the pro side, you kind of basically had the legal eyes. You know, here's the 20 pages of caveats that do what you love isn't what everybody else says. Do what you love is. But how do you address the fact that basically? in terms of the, the narrative in design, the, the main eventer, you know, the, the heavyweight champs of, of this industry who get the big speaking things, the last guy to speak on Saturday night usually are the $1,600 conference guy, the, the people that are just sort of in this as a, uh, you know, the advice industry, the, the people that do put this in terms of if you're not on my level, you don't love it enough and you're not doing it right. You know, this is kind of like this, this debate, everybody really agrees with each other, but in functioning, like when you see this on Twitter, it's, it's really like a poison pill, the phrase now. 
I think you just have to keep calling it out. I mean, if you look up the phrase, do what you love on Google today, right now, you get all the rebuttals, you know, you get the con side, all of it. And, but in one of the, the speeches that comes up is Steve Jobs' commencement speech, where he's like, do what you love, you know, love what you do or whatever, which is total BS, because, you know, if, if he were to do what he loved, he would have been a Zen Buddhist master or whatever, like he, he that's not what his passion was, but he ended up doing that. So I just think that we, it's up to us to, to sort of keep calling it out when we see it. Like, oh, that's easy, you know, call out Steve Jobs. Like, don't just sit there and retweet, hashtag Steve Jobs awesome. Don't pay um, $6,000 for a dinner with an overrated designer. <laughs> not gonna name names. Uh, <laughs> oh. Or just in TED Talks. Like, just like we should call out TED Talks and things like that more. But at the same time, still acknowledge that we all, like, we're here, everyone, I think, is really vibing on the energy. Like, yeah, I'm going to go back and, you know, get back at my project and really work at it. So I just think that it's, it's a balance. I mean, I know we had our caveats, but because I don't think we should take in any media or any mantra or even these signs, we could all sit there and rebut these signs here as well. Um, but just to kind of have a bit of skepticism but still kind of have this core goodness that we're fought, trying to achieve, I guess. Well, we're, we added all those caveats because I don't acknowledge or appreciate or accept the same gods of design that are getting paid thousands of dollars to speak to people. I mean, I was your speaker on Saturday night and I am not one of those people. I didn't get paid $6,000 to speak and I don't work professionally in the advice industry. I'm somebody who doesn't make a lot of money but spends a lot of time doing what I love because it's what I care about. But I think at the end of the day, you're gonna find far fewer people offering rebuttals of this statement than you are gonna find people with shops on Etsy who are spending as much of their time as possible doing exactly what they love. It's not the only thing they're doing, but they are living examples of people who have chosen to take some part of that phrase and make that as much of their day as possible. And I think that's the argument we're in favor of when it comes to do what you love. Can and we get I a response? If, oh, oh. And I think if you're in a position of being able to speak, um, the importance of not using that lazy language of do what you love and actually trying to take a different route and you know talk about the importance of skill building or um, the importance of research like with Veronica's or Martine's talk yesterday. Um, it's just such an easy route to to say you know do what you love and not actually go into what it takes to get to that point. You know, I, I live in Washington, D.C., where there are a lot of corporate lawyers. And there are a lot of corporate lawyers because people went to law school with very idealized, idealized ideas of what they would be as a lawyer and then are under $250,000 of debt and need a way to pay that off. And so they're working 18 hours a day to pay that off and will continue to do that for many, many years. I don't know many happy lawyers. I don't know many happy people in medical school. Um, I think design is an industry. Um, one of which I'm not in, where a lot of people have chosen to take something that they're really good at that's like a skill and apply it, but I don't think that this necessarily applies to other fields in the way that it does in this room. All right, we'll take one more question. How about from down here somewhere? Over there in the back. All right. Hi, do you think that that phrase is a little discouraging? When I hear that phrase, I think, what are you willing to sacrifice that you already love to do something else that you also love? I think, it, I think it's discouraging in the sense that like, when we are reminded with what we're capable of and what we haven't done, that's a downer, you know what I mean? Um, it's something that'll come up in a lot of like motivational speeches and there's, it'll come up in like feel good movies, but like we really do feel the pain and regret of not doing the things we could have tried much worse than the things we failed at, you know, like it's like the, the climax of every love story. It's the climax of like every great, like union busting like sort of movie like Newsies, like you just gotta try. <laughs> you know, like if you, and when you're reminded that you haven't tried, yeah, it, it really sucks, you know? And ultimately at the end of the day, 
the only person that's responsible for whether or not you're happy or content or doing what you love or even if you love being a martyr. You're the only one responsible for that. We sound really intense and scary now. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I keep thinking of the phrase quarter life crisis, which I think is a, it came out of the do what you love idea. Like there, there's this entire group of people who either feel like they can't do what they love or they haven't been able to do what they love. And then they have this like breakdown in their mid twenties, which I also had, um, <laughs> where you're thinking like, what am I doing? Like, sh you know, I think doing what you love and doing what you're passionate about might be too two different, slightly different phrases, or doing something that's meaningful and not necessarily something you love. Uh, th there are variants of this, that I, uh, there are nuances to this phrase that I think would make it more applicable and less the feeling of failure if you're not achieving something that you love. So. I think too, uh, I, I think about, I'm glad you brought this up because we're, we're like multifaceted people, right? And there's a lot of different things we love and how do you uh, prioritize doing this thing over here that maybe even is in conflict with this thing over here or you know, finding ways to try and merge them all together. And I, I don't know if there is, you know, it's not like there's an answer for that, but I would just keep going back to uh, taking risks and trying new things and maybe eventually when you keep trying things and you keep allowing yourself to head down a variety of paths, maybe there's a point where they meet and you can bring more of the things that you do love together in a really unique way that is a perspective only you can offer this world. Thank you. Um, we're going to move into the final phase. So round five or four? Round five. <laughs> um, I'd like to hear your closing arguments. If you could take, what are we at? Five minutes? So five minutes each to kind of wrap up your points, um, caveats and all, and um, pitch, pitch what you have to say to the audience and then we'll vote. We'll start with um, the pro side. Oh, snap. In favor side. So, in closing, um, <laughs> doing what you love isn't necessarily mean quit. It doesn't mean quitting your job or sacrificing the happiness of others around you. It means finding the joy in life and trying to get as much of it as you can because there's so much more to life than your job. You know, if you can make your job the, sor the sole source of your happiness, kudos to you but there's so much more out there that you can find love in. And whether you're underprivileged or overprivileged, you know, um, and to be honest, I think it's kind of a privilege to think that there's, you, the person who's a janitor isn't doing what they love. I mean, you know, they're still finding joy in their life. Otherwise, why would life be worth living, you know? Um, so go do what you love. <laughs> You've got about three and a half more minutes if you want to. <laughs> I love being succinct. Oh. Um, All did right. you guys have anything else to say? <laughs> okay, let's hear from the opposed side. <laughs> One, two, three. Uh, okay, yes. so my... <laughs> My thoughts on, on do what you love is keep the do, ditch the what, and ditch the you, and just focus on love, like love deeply, love greatly, love unabashedly. Like when you put yourself out there from a premise of love, you will not go wrong. You might be scared and you might get hurt a little bit, but it will not kill you. And when you're pursuing a place from love, separate from yourself, the beauty that you can foster and nurture and grow from that is amazing and it does make the world a better place. And that's why you should come from just a place of love and not necessarily 
doing what you love in this moment. And perhaps even we could shift our perspective to come from a place where we're doing what we love in this very moment. All right, so if we could, we'll vote by applause and whooping. <laughs> um, for those who are for doing what you love, let's hear it. All right. For those who are opposed to the phrase, do what you love, and are more for doing love. Let's hear it. <laughs> I like to do love. I don't know how to call that. Oh, actually, you know I what know you, you do. do? I have an idea. You <laughs> yeah. can take a picture of the audience and have the hands raised and you can just like kind of eyeball it. You could, we can divide the rooms. Like if you like this side, go here. If you like this okay, side, Okay, let's here. do, I'll stand up oh. here. You guys do, raise your hands if you're in for the phrase. Okay, hands down. She keeps saying Opposed. She's couching it. Oh, yeah. Oh, snap. I think we have the winner over here. Very nice, very nice. That was awesome. You guys, let's give it up for our amazing panel and our moderator. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Sam. I appreciate that. I appreciate it. So great. You too. You too. That was, that was good stuff. I love it. Um, let's party. It's time to party. I think it's time to party. That was cool.